Hi, good afternoon and welcome to our IWA's Waterways webinar on biodiversity net gain. Uh, I am your host for today, which is and my name is Alex Melson, and I'm the volunteer coordinator for the Inland Waterways Association, uh, primarily working with the Water Recovery Group. Uh, since 2018, I have been part of the uh, Restoration Hub offering environmental ecological advice to uh, canal restoration groups across the country. So the aims of this webinar are to really understand the principles behind biodiversity net gain, uh, to assess how biodiversity net gain can be applied to canal restoration projects, and to really determine the opportunities biodiversity net gain can present to uh, canal restoration. And uh, from this point forward, Biodiversity, biodiversity net gain may be referenced to simply as BNG or as how it may appear on a screen. So uh, let's try and avoid that, that, that level of faff of, uh, sort of saying it all. Okay, um, so what is biodiversity net gain? Oh, I skipped one. Uh, so biodiversity net gain shifts developers away from mitigating environmental impacts through offsetting habitat loss, trading habitats and the ecosystem services uh, they're not that do not actually relate to um, loss on site. So what this actually means is that the new regulations that will be implemented across the UK um, <clears throat> will need to achieve biodiversity net gain, uh, otherwise, which may lead to planning permissions not being um, being permitted. So the biodiversity net gain is an approach that leaves the natural environment in a measurably better state than before. Uh, and with the outcome being a net gain in biodiversity. The, the main uh, focus point for biodiversity net gain is to ensure that at minimum, developers will be um, required to provide at least 10% net gain to biodiversity for any project within the country. Uh, there are a few exceptions, exemptions we may will come across a bit later, um, but this figure is only a minimum and depending on where you're in the country, planning authorities may increase that number to be a bit higher. So biodiversity net gain was introduced through the Environment Bill and I was um, introduced into, into Parliament on the 15th of October uh, 2019. Again, it's, helped, it's the aim is to ensure developments enhance biodiversity and deliver thriving natural spaces uh, for, the, for communities, uh, which is a key theme throughout the, um, the guidance on this. Uh, as of as of current, it is in its seventh sitting at the committee stage in the House of Commons, which is currently uh, on hiatus during the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. So yes, the, in the latest round of DEFRA consultations, um, it almost received unanimous approval from planning authorities, uh, including the Royal Town Planning Institute, to make biodiversity net gain uh, mandatory. And what this means is that we can expect, what we can expect is that this won't be uh, transposed into law into a single action. And this may not quite um, <clears throat> filter down through to each planning authority uh, at the same time. So we can almost expect there'll be a delay between the take up in different areas of the country. But eventually the aim is to have it across the entirety of the UK. And there will be um, a number of bespoke targets and requirements to be met at, at local levels. So here we're looking at um, each region and each lo local local authority will have a number of targets and aspects to a biodiversity action plan or environmental plan they have to achieve. And biodiversity net gain will have to take into account these actions. And to also add on to that, we we also take on a social and um, take into take into account social and economic benefits um, as well. So, quick case study: um, Leedsville District Councils probably one of the first uh, councils to voluntarily embed biodiversity net gain within its local plan. Uh, here, the council requires at minimum twenty percent um, to be gained for them for uh, developments that do do result in a loss of biodiversity. So while it's not, not mandatory at the moment, there, are, it is, there is a massive uptake in the voluntary um, <clears throat> acquisition of biodiversity net gains uh, within local authorities and through large scale developers like uh, Balfour BT and uh, WSP. So there are a number of other factors that do um, fit into how biodiversity net gain may be applied. And here's just a few, more, few of the more notable um, factors here. 
So, um, un so unobtainable be it biodiversity net gain, uh, not all habitat classifications can achieve biodiversity net gain. Um, this is due to the high quality habitats and protected species that they, they offer. Uh, the primary examples here are your sites of special scientific interests, ancient woodlands, uh, special protection areas, special areas of conservation and Ramsar sites. Uh, the, the latter three are EU legislation that may change in the coming years. Um, however, the sites of special scientific interest in ancient woodlands will be subject to un unobtainable biodiversity net gains. So certain phases which will impact um, those habitats and those, 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 um, those areas will not be able to be a biodiversity net gain project. It's also important to remember that it won't be a numbers game. So biodiversity net gain will use the DEFRA's um, biodiversity metric to offer a numerical score to habitats on site. And using this, they will work out what the impacts will be, again, as a numerical score. And what will happen here is they will use that number to work out where we need, how much gain needs to be made throughout the project. But it's important to remember that although this number can give a score, that each site is unique and will require the um, surveys from uh, professional ecologists and, and others to ensure that the ecological function and, <clears throat> uh, and uh, wildlife are recorded. And finally, there are currently a number of proposed exemptions to biodiversity net gain. So currently we're looking at small projects and these include your sort of small scale house extensions and small landscaping projects um, on, a, on a domestic front. Uh, marine environments, they are currently undergoing their own um, biodiversity net gain metric score, scoring system, which canals will, be, will fall under eventually. And here, these, aren't, these are exempt to BNG for the moment um, for that reason. Uh, nationally significant infrastructure projects and those with the backing of government will again be, be exempt. So this is one is um, a cause for contention currently. And a number of brownfield sites which don't offer any uh, priority habitat. So biodiversity net gain is made up of um, 10 principles to ensure, to ensure good practice and it is applied effectively. I will be talking about, uh, about three of these in more detail in, in a bit, so I'm going to quickly gloss over these ones for the moment. So um, principle one is applying the mitigation hierarchy. The uh, mitigation hierarchy is already um, instilled within the development sector um, in constru and construction and these essentially are made of measures to help avoid, minimise and compensate for damages um, from development. Principle two, that is to look at how avoiding biodiversity losses that cannot be offset by gains uh, elsewhere. So this is, as I mentioned earlier, about your triple SIs, your nature reserves and uh, ancient woodlands that cannot, be, that cannot be offset by gains due to irreversible damage. Principle three is all about inclusivity and uh, being equitable. Uh, here, we're looking at engaging stakeholders from start to finish to create key partnerships and to really develop your biodiversity net gain projects uh, in line with the local, um, local strategies. Uh, principle four is to address risk. It's all about thinking about a contingency and avoiding a, to avoid aiming for the minimum net 10% and losing out from unexpected scenarios such as invasive species or pollution events that could completely derail your biodiversity net gain project. So here it's all about aiming higher and uh, being able to mitigate the risk from, from those losses. Five is you want to make a measurable net gain contribution. The key here is measurable. Um, the planning authorities will want to see throughout the project that you are on target to, re to, to reach your, 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 your promised biodiversity net gain. So here's all about looking at how uh, air, the uh, full area will be, the full area will be um, impacted and looking at how fun uh, functionality will also be impacted. Principle six is about achieving the best outcomes for biodiversity. I'll go into a bit more detail again about this in a little bit, but it's all about an evidence-based approach in relation to the wider environment. Principle seven, be additional. It's all about not replacing uh, like for like and exactly the same, 
it's all, all about replacing the habitat but also looking to enhance your existing habitats and exist and enhance the habitat you're looking to replace and that's where you'll be looking to get your your net gain from uh, an example here would be having a hedgerow instead of planting just three species uh, make it up to seven um, to, to ensure that you do have those net gains. Uh, principle eight is again looking to be, um, is about creating a net gain legacy and that's about ensuring lo long term gains. So this is looking at the, what the bigger picture on mitigating climate change impacts such as flooding, uh, flooding risk and drought ensuring that your community stakeholders um, are, are, are happy and that there are, is considerable management throughout the project's life cycle to, to ensure biodiversity net gain is achieved. Uh, principle nine is looking to optimise sustainability and here it's all about looking at the at BNG at the beginning of the project not at the end or during. It should be really made a priority at the planning stages and to really help make up the, the bulk of, of many fundraising bids. And principle 10, looking at being transparent, that's all about sharing your experience. It's almost certainly known that there's going to be difficulties and um, failures and successes throughout the country. It's all about letting everyone know what went wrong, and what, what went wrong where and why. <clears throat> So principle, we'll go back to principle one, which is the uh, applying the mitigation hierarchy. So as I previously mentioned, there's three um, categories here, um, going from top top to bottom. So the primary um, category to try and try and achieve is to avoid creating impacts from the outset. Secondly, you want to look at minimizing the impact. So this is measures taken to reduce the duration, intensity or extent of impacts that can't be avoided during the development stage. And finally, there's the compens uh, compensatory measures, and these are to improve degraded, removed ecosystems uh, following, to ex following the exposure of, of impacts, and again to offset adverse impacts after previous steps have been followed. And so here's a few more examples of what, um, what we mean by avoidance. So while it's always not, might not always be possible, and I do know that there are a number of uh, canal routes going through now protected sites, um, it's looking at try, uh, potentially uh, avoiding that damage by altering the proposed routes or finding ways around going through protected habitats such as triple SIs. And this is often potentially the sometimes cheaper and the most sensible action in order to, to achieve um, Bear with me, I think my screen's going a bit interesting there. Sorry about that, I had a bit of a technical technical, technical glitch on my uh, on my laptop. So, sorry about that. So, uh, number two is looking at how the timing of your works and when they're, when they're taking place. Uh, the prime example here is working in environments with nesting birds. By avoiding the bird nesting season, which which runs between um, sort of late September to uh, to mid March, you can completely avoid damaging that that, that, that level of ecology. And uh, look, and finally, there's retention. So it's all about whether you can somehow hold um, on to certain environments or f ecological functions and features um, during your, your proposed works. So you can keep the offside bank in vegetation if you're dredging a canal or relying a new channel. Sorry, bear with me, I'm having more laptop issues. There you go. So the next um, category, so second one down of the hierarchy, is uh, measures to minimise the, um, the impact of works. So examples here include uh, planning, and this can be anything from looking at your lighting zones um, and the type of lights used to prevent the damage to, um, to bat ecology and their sort of foraging behaviours. Uh, reducing your uh, incorporating wildlife crossings and specific transit routes to avoid as much disruption as possible. It's also worth looking at your work schedule. So in terms of what hours your volunteers are working are creating a disruption on site and um, particularly like looking at vibrations that could also impact uh, wildlife. And there's also finally looking at what equipment you're using, whether you can be fine using uh, particular um, 
equipment with greater noise reduction, uh, fuel efficiency, reduced leaks, and um, ensuring that their biosecurity measures um, are in place to prevent prevent those um, prevent the spread of invasive species. And finally, we have the compensation level, um, compensate measures. So these, again, these are the ones to improve degraded or removed ecosystems following the um, impacts. So uh, firstly, there's replacing the habitats that have been lost. So whether you take out a tree that may have held um, bats or may have been a good um, may have been a good area for bats to um, to roost by installing new bat boxes, um, creating new ponds, and adding ditches and little um, and other smaller habitats here, here, and there. Uh, there's also looking at how you can enhance your um, your project. So once the works are complete, if you well, we're renovating a, a canal with both with two um, hard engineered sides, you could think about how you might be able to somehow remove one side and plant up with um, native for, um, flora in order to to revegetate that area and create a um, a better environment for, for wildlife. Uh, as well as looking at installing eel and fish weirs um, at locks to help improve the ecological connectivity of certain species. And then finally, when all other measures have failed or, can't, or haven't, haven't, haven't been considered, you look at offsetting. And these are just measures taken to completely replace the, um, what, what's been removed uh, elsewhere, locally or further afield. So a bit more on principle three, which is being inclusive and, and equitable. Um, this again is all about looking at engaging your stakeholders uh, throughout your project. Um, so where you can utilize stakeholders to, to really enhance your biodiversity net gain project is um, through monitoring of how the project is, is going from beginning to end and having independent um, individuals come, for, for, come through to really give a, a third party um, idea of what's, what, how your project is doing. Um, funding, not, not about, it's all about not being scared to approach funders with, with these bids and um, not, not being scared to incorporate biodiversity net gain projects uh, into, into your larger large scale bids. Also looking at meeting local and national priorities and targets, um, finding third party management. So these could be um, statutory nature conservation organisations or other charity groups that may be looking to adopt a certain stretch and also ensure that your biodiversity net gain project um, after completion of the project is, is maintained, uh, as well as looking at ecological surveys and also really gathering public support to the whole project in, in general. And principle six is about achieving the best outcomes for biodiversity. So I'll quickly list through each of these points. So um, delivering compensation that is ecologically equivalent by type, amount, condition, uh, that accounts for the location and timing of biodiversity losses. Uh, what this is essentially asking is for the project to avoid replacing uh, one habitat for uh, a lesser habitat, or one that's not um, ecologically equivalent. So what that means is if you take a, a, a lake and you fill it in or replace it with woodland that is um, uh, entirely a no-no in uh, biodiversity net gain because that, that, that shifts to touch the ecological niches um, for the local priorities. Uh, two, we want to compensate for the losses of one type of biodiversity uh, by providing a type that delivers greater benefits for nature conservation. So this is a bit um, different from the previous points. This is for example taking one grass and let's say an amenity grass and with shortcut grass and um sort of and a very low species diversity and then altering that and making it a a, a better wildlife haven for for, for ecology and um, whether that's planting in a new native species or, or really sort of in incorporating a a mowing regime or a grass regime to to improve it so it's really about trying to improve how our habitats you have on site as well uh, look number three is achieving net gain locally to the project, um, contributing to local and regional and, and national strategy. So this really is all about <clears throat> trying to keep your um, compensation measures, measures, your avoidance, and, and all, basically keep the mitigation hierarchy as local as possible, and try to avoid shifting any of the offset offsets 
uh, further afield than necessary. Uh, number four is, is to also ensure that you enhance existing and, cre and creating new habitats which are also uh, enhanced. And five is enhancing ecological connectivity by creating more bigger, better and joined up areas of biodiversity. And he here is where I really see biodiversity net gain being a, um, a, a massive opportunity for, for canal restoration. It's very, very hard to find okay, um, connected sites that will be able to link up different habitats across the country, um, as well as a canal would. And I'll come on to that a little bit more later on as well. So we're now going to look at how we can uh, apply biodiversity net gain to canal restoration. And I'll talk you, uh, I'll talk you through this now. So applying biodiversity net gain really is, is essential to get in as, as early as, as possible to really understand the, the impacts on, on, the, on, the, on the land around you. <clears throat> So firstly, it's about um, scoping out and looking at the feasibility of the projects and whether that can achieve biodiversity net gain uh, and, what, and what can or can't be achieved uh, elsewhere. So it's assessing whether the project can uh, achieve it through seeking support, guidance, and trying to achieve that win-win scenario for both restoration and uh, biodiversity. We then want to look at assessing the ecological impacts and um, this will often, take on large scale projects, uh, necessitate ecological assessments um, against the baseline features of, of your site. And um, from here, we can identify the potential impacts and what works would, it would require mitigation and, and whereabouts we can find that. Um, habitat trading. This is to ensure that biodiversity gain project actually adds and enhances the natural environment. Uh, and again, not to transform a range of habitat types, but, but keep it as it was historically or, or better. The uh, location and biodiversity features. This is where possible, um, compensation offsetting measures should be as close as to the locality of the, of the works as possible. Uh, we then look at enhancement, which is where emphasis is, is placed on ensuring the area of habitat lost is provided and gained uh, elsewhere. Um, it doesn't mean that we should completely negate uh, enhancing existing habitats locally and nearby as well, and this all adds up in adds into your biodiversity net gain scores. And then finally, um, what often people forget about is the impact of um, time lags and time scales of works. Um, the key here is to reduce the uh, length of time the project impacts the um, habitats um, and ensuring that biodiversity net gain objectives are met and the, um, the impacts to the environment are minimised. Uh, an example from, for, for this may, may, may be along the lines of, if you're looking at a, pow, um, a, canal, a, well, a canal, you drain it in sections and not all, all in one go in order to give fish a refuge, um, but also avoiding the, keeping the drainage going on for too long. So here's just a quick list of how you might want to approach biodiversity net gain if, you, if you're working within canal restoration or, or towards, towards those aims. So step one is to um, assess the baseline features, assess the potential impacts against the baseline features and to identify what habitats you have on site and if there's any um, protected areas, protected species. Secondly, it's all about thinking strategically. Uh, identify where you will come across your limitations and where opportunities would also present themselves and to really get in early and engage with the stakeholders um, on these. And then thirdly, it's all about, uh, all about planning <clears throat> for the whole route um, and in sections. So using the mitigation hierarchy is about breaking down the, the restoration in phases and to really um, create a, a biodiversity net gain operations plan. And this plan will help us identify proper, um, efficient habitat management plans and <clears throat> really help us ensure that the net gains do, do, do stick. Uh, a little quick hint is to know that not all habitats are equal. Um, size, designation, connectivity, protected species and invasives all play a part in the calculation of biodiversity units that will indicate how many units you have to get for to achieve biodiversity net gain. And um, it's just, just really important to remember that there is a variety of habitats out there. So 
So we look at biodiversity again, we sort of take a step back and wonder, and then just want to see how biodiversity again can really uh, help canal restoration um, achieve its, its, its own strategic gains. I guess the, um, the main, I guess the, the main protections um, come from <clears throat> the greater your, your, your environment around your canal, the better protection you may receive against um, damaging building uh, operations and damaging developments that will take away from the, the canal scenery or the, or the, the historical nature of, of the canal. It can also allow us to be able to find, uh, create more miles and um, improve our green corridor, which is um, creating an ecological network for, for wildlife. And through working with biodiversity um, and, the, and the ecology, you can really strategically um, push your projects out towards the, the local, local community and sort of show them the net benefits. Uh, from a social perspective, it will also improve um, community engagement um, improves the sort of well-being and health of people in that area, as well as access um, is access into the areas as well. From an economic point of view, um, if, with a lovely green green canal with um, with, with proper with good environmental credentials, that will also increase your funding streams. It will bring more tourists to the area, and you'll even be able to potentially find offset opportunities for other developers um, in the future, which I'll again come on to a little bit a bit later. So I'm going to quickly take you through what a, what biodiversity again may look like for um for for a canal restoration project and uh, please ignore the uh, the two lock gates which are certainly facing the wrong direction as an error on my behalf. So firstly, um, we're looking at how biodiversity again how the project will, will impact the um, the baseline features in the habitat. So it's about all about identifying the proposed route. And then seeing what habitats it will be uh, impacting on, and using the um, DEFRA's biodiversity metric, each um, habitat will be given a, a loss based on its own designation through uh, an ecological survey um, uh, organisation. So some habitats here again are, although they're, they're bigger, they might be less valuable habitats or, or, or not protected. So what we will be then be looking to do is once we've identified our route is to try and apply the mitigation hierarchy um, to, to the project. So here we're going to try and input some avoidance measures to, um, to, to achieve biodiversity net gain. So again, it's looking at proposed routes where we can somehow avoid impacting the largest area of, of, of ecological loss. Um, so for, we have a proposed route going around it, um, around the, uh, the two larger habitats, uh, we, we save over, over 24 units of, of, of biodiversity loss. Next, we look at how we can uh, minimise the impact of our project. And here we can look at how we would um, phase the restoration. Uh, in some of our habitats, we may be able to work all year. There's no, no significant damage that, can, that would, would really affect the local ecology, but in others, um, such as say have that be might be a woodland we would need to make sure that we work through it during the right times of year again avoiding bird nesting season for, for example and that may take place between October and March so by planning the, the project to, in phases you can really again minimize the impact on a number of ecological species and, and different features. Finally, let's say we've now got our canal. We've we've managed to put our project in. We've got we've got our, we've got our approved route. Um, it's all now about compensating for damages we do um, we do we do impact on. So that could be looking at creating new habitats in areas that you may own or or, or control, um, and that can be improving certain habitats such as habitat C. You can extend that outwards and create a new um, higher functioning ecological habitat. You could look at also incorporating enhancement um, projects in. So if we've impacted our woodland, as we have here, we can think about how we can artificially make trees more ancient um, by adding in new features, um, such as cutting in large chunks of, um, or cutting large chunks in the canopy, incorporating bat roosts, um, or even installing otter holes along the, um, the edge, of, edge of the canal environment. And again, looking at adding more, more habitats, we can install hedgerows in um, less, 
protected areas such as Habitat A, which had a very minimal um, value for wildlife. Then we can also look again at improving our ecological connectivity through installing eel or fish passes um, through and around locks, and which is a which is very very much being looked at quite heavily now by a lot of a lot of uh, conservation groups. And also, not to forget, you can enhance your canal once you've you've dug your canal. Always think about how you can make this ecologically viable. Whether you can stick in um, shallower edges along one side for fish nurseries or in, input some reed beds, habitats, uh, or even put in some extra off offline ponds um, nearby. So now we're going to look at how how we would uh, achieve biodiversity net gain if we couldn't achieve the above measures. We couldn't avoid um, avoid our previous route. We're now looking at how we would uh, offset it to achieve biodiversity net gain. So we'll take our route here. We'll stick to our, uh, I believe it's 29.01 units um, lost. So firstly, we look trying to identify where we could expand the um, the habitats or enhance them to to meet to uh, to counteract the losses. And it's important here to make sure that you try and get your 10% um, net gain in each of these habitats at, at, at minimum. So if we take our original route, um, or which was originally 29.01 units, and then we apply our, our, our new units gained, or our new unit, unit value if we incorporate all, our, <clears throat> all of our measures, which gives us 39.5 units, and this is a total net gain of 10.49. And this actually leads us to a 36% 36 increase in um, biodiversity net gain, which again, it is far, far above the minimum. And this gives us a bit more room for, for maneuver. If for example, um, one of our project, one of our plans doesn't get the, get the go ahead. So here's just a couple of examples of um, opportunities to, to achieve uh, biodiversity net gain um, across, your, across the project. So through built structures, you're building plenty of lock houses or, or other sort of community buildings. Um, think about the idea of um, incorporating it into, into the design of the buildings. You can um, <clears throat> look about having green roofs, um, incorporating green roofs or more efficient energy sources. Um, look at adding in extra uh, <clears throat> habitat such as ponds, um, hibernaculums, which is the picture on this on the second from the second from the right, uh, which is a log pile for reptiles, mammals to really thrive. Um, below that we have a have a sand bank which is used for butterflies to, to bask in, in the sun. We can also look about improving our meadows, um, incorporating hedgerows, hedge laying, uh, installing bat bricks into our locks, bridges and our other buildings. And I, even um, adding in inf information boards is um, a key a key part of biodiversity net gain. And here's a few examples uh, across canal restoration. So one of the mo more commonly known projects is the um, Aston Nature, Nature Reserve on the Montgomery Canal, which to compensate for um, rest restoration through triple SIs, uh, sites of special in scientific interest and um, for the Great Western Meat Population, there was an off-site nature reserve built locally, which um, species would be transferred into um, to compensate for the, for the restoration of that canal. Uh, or going on uh, on the Stradwater navigation, currently they're building um, building canal. We were building the canal through a roundabout, and you can maybe just about see the uh, number of trees have been kept um, intact for this. This is again a, 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 a this is a retention scheme to 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 ensure that. Um, some habitats are, are, are kept kept safe. Uh, again, also on the Cotswold Canal at Dugbridge Upper Lock, they have installed a fish pass to help the ecological connectivity um, side of things, so fish can continue to to manoeuvre throughout the um, the Stroudwater Canal. <clears throat> uh, on the way in Aaron, they've got a, um, a hedge laying team that spends a lot of the winter going going on the canals and um, going on the canal and in enhancing um, that habitat. Another prime example is is on the Litchfield Canal, which I believe has been um, exposed to the um, biodiversity net gain uh, to to try and achieve a twenty percent net gain as part of Litchfield Council's um, permissions, and they are building um, a, a wetland sort of a, a wetland refuge area along part of the canal to create a a, ref, a, ref, a refuge for for the wildlife. And again, on the Shrewsbury Newport, they're currently developing Wappenshaw Wharf. 
and they've installed both our boxes and bat boxes into the um into the design of the building which will become a, a community hub i i i'm i'm correct and finally as i said I mentioned this is what i believe is the um the key strength of waterways especially with regards to biodiversity net gain it's um <clears throat> by creating a habitat corridor which connects disparate habitats um across um regions across the country and really provides that ecological function of get of bridging the gap um, and really going through several several localities to help ensure that the strategies of each local uh, region is is met. So finally, I'm going to talk to you quickly about um, managing biodiversity net gain. So responsibility for managing biodiversity net gain uh, may extend for up to 30 years after the project's completed, which is one of the biggest shifts um, from the current planning procedures. Um, currently, developers can uh, put in a habitat and leave it to mature, um, and this, in a lot of cases, can actually lead, lead to a more of a degraded habitat as opposed to what was originally originally there. And the biodiversity aim really hopes to ensure that developers think thoroughly about what what they're putting in place. Is that going to work? Ah, there we go. So. Responsibility falls to a number of key roles, which do include contractors, brokers, and third parties um, for the duration of the project lifecycle. And again, as I mentioned, up to 30 years uh, or more after the project's completion. So here it's really important to measure and record and report each and that if each habitat is meeting its net gain outcomes set out, set out within the project plans and ensuring that the ongoing management can be ma managed by the developers themselves or passed over to a, a third party with uh, ongoing budgets and support. So a couple of things to really think about are the, the costs of, of a project with, regard, with regards to biodiversity net gain. Um, and it's, again, as I mentioned previously, don't be afraid to put your biodiversity net, get, net gain costs into funding bids as, again, funders are looking for it assurances that the environment is fully considered within the, within the purchase and this includes your land purchases your off your off-site offsets um looking at getting in third party management organizations to help maintain the net gain uh your monitoring reporting and, and of course for for inflation um again they also make sure you you're monitoring um the site again throughout the whole uh, project life cycle and meeting the specified outcomes and this really lets you review and report um, how the project is going. And this leads you to allow, uh, allows us to uh, adaptively manage the project in a way if, that we can identify if um, an area is falling short somewhere where we can find net gain in our parts of the project to, to mitigate um, not, not, not meeting one of our targets. And finally, one evidence again about this measurable and achievable objectives that can be um, accessed by a number of individuals, whether that be the um, restoration itself, uh, outside charity groups, or, or the planning authority, and really plan and uh, to ensure that all contingencies are, are provided in case uh, biodiversity again might not be um, be possible to, uh, in some areas. So now we're looking at how we're sort of, again, managing biodiversity net gain. So one area that restoration groups might find uh, opportunity is by acting as a, a third party in biodiversity net gain. Um, as potential landowners, land managers involved with canal restoration, uh, other developers or local planning authorities um, within the area might, may, may, may well be looking for sites, habitats and projects which could support their, their own biodiversity net gain projects. Uh, and this is this idea is called um, habitat banking. So here, your local authority and, and developers are essentially trying to identify sites which could welcome offsets from different groups uh, in order to meet their own development aims, as a lot of sites will struggle to find, um, be able to offer local, <clears throat> uh, local um, offset measures. So here, restoration groups could benefit from supporting these mitigation measures from local developers. And uh, here it's important to remember that actually the canal environment is, is listed as a habitat type in, in pretty much all um, habitat classifications. And this can almost certainly be used to um, receive support, whether that be monetary or, or work related 
to actually help restore sections of the canal in, in an area. And here, restoration groups really look at how looking look at their ecological priorities across the whole um, <clears throat> the whole stretch, and trustees and, and committee and, and trustees um, looking to respond to these requests through offering sites or projects that they could um, could receive. And again, just always work with your local stakeholders to to and approach developers in the area who and, and offer them potential areas in which they can can offset into. Uh, so in summary, uh, biodiversity and again will be phased into local planning over the next next few years. Uh, again, it won't come out all, all in one go. So be be prepared that it's going to possibly come into different areas quicker than others. Um, it should also be really considered as early on in the project as possible, and a long term management plan to be really prepared and created yeah, in advance to really guide the um, guide your group through through the through the through the, uh, the net gain. Uh, biodiversity again should be seen as a way to achieve um, a win-win scenario for both biodiversity and canal restoration. And here it's about ensuring that you're um, that, that you put forward the, the I guess the um, <clears throat> the key points of how your project can ultimately shape the um, shape how local and regional targets are met and how they can really uh, enhance biodiversity in in certain areas. And also take a look at biodiversity again as an opportunity to increase the reach of your your restoration um, your canal restoration with key stakeholders. Um, people people love uh, love wildlife. People love um, seeing wildlife on their front door. So really think about how you can uh, approach these stakeholders with your um, new biodiversity net gain opportunities to to ensure that, that you're enhancing the area for the local community. And Really, my final point is to say that uh, canal restoration is really is in a un unique position to gain from um, biodiversity net gain, and can finally evidence the fact that re canal restorations do uh, enhance the natural environment and have a ma major role to play in the um, in coming years to ensure that governmental objectives um, to 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 improve the environment are, are met. So there's a couple of useful resources. Um, there's a whole guidance notes on, on um, the CIEM website, which is the Chartered Institute of Ecological and Environmental Management. And they're really the, um, at the forefront of, of, of pursuing biodiversity net gain being mandatory across, across, the, across the UK. And they're working very closely with DEFRA, who I recommend again, and the IEMA, which is the Institute of Ecological and Management Association. And uh, finally, Natural England are also um, undertaking a lot of consultation and reviews um, on behalf of a number of stakeholders. So here you can really find a lot more information than I can really give you in, in about 40, 45 minutes on, on this topic. Uh, so I, I find I'm sort of happy to answer any questions people may have. Um, and if I can't answer them, I will um, try and get back to you as soon as I can with, a, with, with, with an answer. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, there, I'm pleased to say there are a whole raft of questions which we might struggle to get, get through. In, <laughs> actually, we have 12 questions in 12 minutes, so there's a challenge. Um, uh, and yeah, let's rattle through them. So uh, will the eventual legislation cover canal side housing developments where towpath hedges are damaged or entirely removed? I think the quick answer to that is probably the existing planning should have ensured that didn't happen this probably will just give extra focus to it so yes quite quite likely that it will that will be picked up far quicker uh, far more consistently than before um there's the whole question of it's not going is it not going to be difficult to quanti quantify the gain in many areas uh alex this really is the whole question of the metric isn't it um and uh finding um an expert to apply it uh, who's believed on all sides and trusting on all sides yeah, that's correct. Um, I did incorporate the biodiversity metric into the um, into the presentation, uh, but due to time time constraints, it was a bit too um, too in depth to really get into, um, and would require a, a full day on it, its own right. Um, but yeah, it's all about finding the <clears throat> the the right people who can undertake these um, undertake these surveys for you and can very quickly use the, the metric 
Um, and I have used it myself, and it's a very simple to use metric, and you can get a good baseline yourself if you take the time to really uh, identify it. Okay, uh, yes, I think the, the whole question of the metric is going to be an interesting one, and, and we ought to mention, Alex, as far as I understand, the metric still doesn't actually include this key feature for canals uh, of somehow quantifying connectivity, the fact that your waterway joins up to uh, selected sites to safe sites. Is that still the case? That's that's still the case. Um, the, the issue here is we have the biodiversity metric which works very well for your terrestrial habitats. So if your canal is not in water, it works particularly well when identifying it. Um, doesn't work so well when you're trying to use it as a baseline to compare what the value would be once you rewater that section. So they're currently undergoing a review of this and then add, adding in that ecological functional um, functionality uh, into the project. Um, and once that's all ready, I'll be having a, a review of it to see how it can really be incorporated into canal restoration, whether it actually actually works for, for, for our purposes. Yeah, so so at the moment you can't quite get it into the metric. You have to add, add, a, add an addendum at the end of it to kind of uh, suggest something. We are working on A, the best set of words for that addendum, but also uh, trying to make sure that we can get it pushed into the, the metric as we go along. Um, a, a fascinating question uh, here. What's the most important thing that canal users can be asked to do to bring biodiversity net gain? Well, that's actually very interesting. Um, so from, what, from what, what I'm seeing it is canal users can really be um, sort of used in a way of how it helps sort of survey and monitor the, the site for biodiversity net gain. And, to really, I guess, get involved in canal restorations. Um, so, <laughs> my little plug there. I mean, so in, in terms of on, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, canal users can easily can help identify uh, areas where invasive species may exist. Maybe have to also get involved in managing the um, biodiversity net gain after the project's completed. There's going to be a lot of uh, opportunity to create. Um, uh, Groups that part of sections um, and adopt areas to keep uh, keep up keep it for wildlife. Um, so I guess the short answer is it's if canal users want to get get involved with canal restoration, that's the best way to really uh, improve um, a canal's biodiversity net gain opportunities. Uh, okay, we'll uh, we'll rattle through this uh, quickly. Uh, <laughs> the 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 killer uh, the killer pub quiz pub question kind of thing. Does BNG mean that there is no prospect of reopening a canal through a triple SI if the canal can, canal cannot be diverted? No, 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 not at all. It's um, it's looking at how you phase the project. Um, in in these cases, I know it's already quite difficult to get permissions through triple SIs as as it is. Um, but it's looking at how you phase your project. So um, you you if you phase your project to the local council from the beginning of the triple SI to um, the, the bit before, that bit of the canal will, can receive a biodiversity net gain and same for anything afterwards. It will require a lot more engagement at stakeholder level to, to get the SSI section really um, finding the mitigation measures to, to ensure that it is protected and I don't know that, whether that will be through um, restricting boat movements, um, creating um, eco tones in areas where canal where boats can't pass through, um, but that all depends very much on what's in your triple SI, um, what particular species are available, uh, and what your local council's priorities currently are. Um, the, the inevitable question that is very difficult to answer at the moment, because of course nobody's actually successfully implementing it, but at what point do cost and convenience trump biodiversity loss in say the route of the canal? <laughs> Uh, well, according to the government, HS2 is one of those. Um, so HS2 is currently exempt, um, but that doesn't mean that these large infrastructure projects don't won't voluntarily offer biodiversity net gain into their plans um, in, at tender. Um, as you say, it's a very difficult question. Um, at what point does cost trump it? Um, I think believe the whole point of um, biodiversity net gain was to try and um, get developers to think closely about yeah, they, they have that stare they're impacting and to really avoid that absolute loss that you can't get back. Um, it's, it's for example, the ancient ancient woodlands, though it may not be so common for us to be going through an ancient woodland, um, that the ancient woodlands are older than six, six um, were originally planted pre-1600. 
Um, so in order to replicate that kind of habitat, uh, it is almost impossible. So the whole idea of the net game was to try and ensure that these habitats are preserved as much as possible. Okay, here's, here's a, an interesting and practical one. Uh, inevitably, BNG is going to dig into unrestricted funds. Uh, obviously, we can actually ask for extra funding to cover this, but is there any possibility of IWA achieving funding to recruit an ecologist or two to be available to restoration charities? Um, obviously, Alex is already working with quite a lot of the restoration charities uh, there. I think one, one of the issues that is interesting is that the, the we spent obviously the other way spends most of its time just say tr applying transferable lessons so you are absolutely saying look at this economic regeneration that occurred in swindon it could equally well occur in bath take your pick whatever but one of the things about the environmental side of it and the ecological side of it is it's very difficult to say that it's a, a similar and applicable transferable lesson because all the environmental considerations are different so there is that tricky question of do you want a a specialist who understands canals or do you want a specialist who understands the local environment um alex have you got any more comments on that yeah, i mean in a lot of cases it's, it's, it's important that you can find um find or well, try and find find someone who, 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 does, who does both um <laughs> I've had plenty of um, conversations with. Uh, I've lost my my little headset fell out there. Uh, but you probably hear me anyway. Yeah. Um, I've had plenty of conversations with um, different members of different groups, and there's a very sometimes a big disconnect between the value of canals against other habitats. Um, and this is where I think biodiversity again really helps us, and that we can now um, categorically prove that canal restoration has benefits and is is good for the environment and once this once we start seeing this through our, our projects we can start arguing at more government levels regional and even to local nature conservation groups that the work we're doing is absolutely pivotal for, for improving wildlife across the country okay and yes and and the idea is obviously is working working on this as hard as it can to actually try and work out the best way to do it but i think that you know in terms of our contribution, it will be best if you have a local expert on your site for us to talk to about the benefits of waterways. Um, are there any financial incentives for a BNG greater than the minimum 10%? Uh, I, I would say that there is, yes. Um, though it may cost um, a little bit extra, the, the, the more net gain you try and achieve could cost, um, could add a bit more cost to your, to your projects here and there. Um, <clears throat> The financial aim um, you want to try, you can possibly look at, is through um, sort of tourism and, and nature and health and well-being, and sort of getting in memberships and donors to that, that use your use your canal. Um, everyone everyone loves wildlife. Everyone loves the cute ducks and the cute um, uh, creatures you can find along the waterways. So the more uh, more of these features that you can get coming to your area, the great opportunities there are to improve your your connections uh, locally. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a question. Uh, local net gain is obviously preferable, but is there a geographical limit on the location of offsetting measures? Uh, I believe I'm not, I'm not entirely sure currently whether there is a uh, um, cross country, but there will inevitably be certain habitats around the country which aren't particularly. Uh, can't be replic replic replicated uh, elsewhere. Um, for example, in Wales, there are, are sand dunes, which are um, particularly brilliant for sand lizards and reptiles, and these are particularly replicable in other parts of the country. So, for example, you have, to, you have a sand dune habitat in North of Wales, and the nearest one is in the south of Wales. That would be probably agreeable, but again, by aiming as locally as possible. Yeah, I think I think that, so. The issue, so the issue there is obviously, for starters, every every area, every region is going to be policed slightly differently. Uh, so actually, it will be very much dependent on what what your environmental, the environmental department of your council and the planning department will be trying to encourage. I think, um, uh, which leads on to handily, who polices all this? Planners, biologists, wildlife trusts, and councils. I don't say all the above. Um, 
So primarily, it will be in the hands of the planning authorities to, to ensure that the targets and objectives that, they, um, that you have set and they have set uh, are met. But there will be onus on the, on the groups to ensure that the, um, the surveys are carried out at different points throughout the project and to ensure that they are being reported uh, accurately. Think of it as a, 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 an environmental audit um, throughout different stages of the, of the project. Um, so the onus really falls on, on all groups and where possible, you can try and shift ability to other groups such as your wildlife trusts or local community groups and get them involved in, in the process. Uh, okay, uh, very, very quickly, will farmers benefit from the new stewardship scheme if they create biodiversity on the off side of the canal? Well, I believe they, probably, they would most likely be able to achieve that. Um, there's a bit of, sort of an, a, a gap in identifying at what point does them, uh, does the a landowner on the side of the canal biodiversity net gain measures, uh, how will it impact uh, and other groups' ability to provide net, net gain opportunities, um, but I'm, I'm sure that farmers would be able to work, work with the local local plannings and kind of restoration groups to to in, ensure that they do uh, they do fall in those those stewardship stewardship, stewardship uh, standards. Okay. Uh, the, the final one on habitat banking seems to offer a huge potential benefit to restorations, um, and I think this is going to actually be one of the key key things. Um, some people will think it's a, a kind of golden golden goose that's laying endless eggs. Um, whereas I think it really is, it sounds a great idea, but actually it will be down to whether the local planning authority takes it up and considers it to be a really good thing, or whether they're thinking, actually, you should still try and implement this locally, stop trying to trade off with others. Um, so I think we'll have to wait and see how that comes out. Um, to be fair though, habitat banking was barely mentioned in the initial stages of the legislation, so they have slackened off to the point of, oh, perhaps we can trade things off. Um, Alex, do you have any other comments on the habitat banking as a concept? Uh, yeah, so it's been sort of quite heavily discussed at the debating stage, and it seems quite um, optimistic that the, local, uh, the MPs have been discussing it quite, quite heavily um, as, as a favoured option. Um, but again, it's all about following the previous steps and ensuring that the developers achieve it locally. Um, but it doesn't, by all means, doesn't mean if you can't achieve it locally, you can potentially look at your, your have that banking opportunities um, elsewhere. And the local authorities will put them together sites and they really, really do the enhancement. Uh, okay, uh, so currently as a result of BNG, have we received any increase in investment in restoration canals? I don't, I don't think we've got there yet. Oh, uh, not at all at the moment. I mean, it's still very much in its early stages, um, but of course that doesn't mean that there won't be opportunities to, to attract investment um, elsewhere. Okay, uh, what's, uh, what's the difference between biodiversity net gain and environmental net gain? Also, oh, biodiversity, biodiversity gain is the, um, is the overarching new legislation that we're coming in. Environmental net gain will, be, will fall um, within that. So, um, as opposed to a lot of the time, it used to be habitat surveys and protected species surveys or different surveys would, wouldn't be too connected. Um, biodiversity net gain looks to really combine both of them um, in a more of a, 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 a I guess, a, a more a fuller picture, um, a more wide ranging understanding that both play a part in each other's quite quite considerably. Okay, uh, any advice on who to go to in local authorities to offer and explore potential uh, to provide BNG and link up with developers? So there's usually um, an environmental planning officer who deals with a lot of these, these areas in the local authority, um, but it's just about finding the right contact within that, that planning authority. So I'd recommend sort of com um, sending out an email to, to the, um, I guess, the head of the department, and they'll be able to sort of trickle it down to the correct area. But, um, but saying this, not all planning authorities are fully up to, up to scratch with the proposed changes. So you may have success, more success in some areas than in others. Oh, it's it's always best to go in and teach them uh, teach them what they should be doing. 
Um, okay, uh, we are going to carry on. We've got about four more questions at the moment, so we are going to carry on, but we should be done within within a five minutes. Um, uh, seeing as everybody seems quite interested in this, uh, what is this? Uh, are you working with researchers into the health benefits of the waterways to society? Because I think this is one of the uh, this 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 is theoretically as powerful a thing as the connected side. So the thing about uh, it did say at the very start that it will take into account social and economic benefits. So absolutely, one of the things in the same way as um, uh, waterways are very good in terms of connecting things, but actually nobody takes that into account, or it's difficult to take that into account. Actually, the whole uh, health benefits is is considerable. Lots of people doing research on that, but actually, how do you apply it? How do you how do you shoehorn that in? Terrible expression. I apologise. Into your uh, biodiversity net gain, have we got any evidence of that happening at the moment? So the forefront of the discussion is just yet, um, uh, but there was a slide I did remove from the presentation due to time constraints. Um, I just took quotes from the uh, the Environment Agency um, Minister who, who offered up the Environment, um, Environment Bill, and a few of his quotes um, with regards to biodiversity again uh, were such things as deliver thriving natural spaces for communities. Um, Again, he, he, he keeps mentioning it, mentioning the word community. So another thing he said, enhance biodiversity and help deliver thriving natural spaces for communities. Um, stronger abilities to improve, improve health and social outcomes for local citizens. So this was mentioned about three or four times in a single page. So you can sort of see where they're looking to, to market and, and improve biodiversity again to make it more encompassing than just for, for wildlife. But how, how we achieve that hasn't been yet uh, disclosed. Yep. Okay. Yeah. But at least, it's, at least it's feeling uh, that this is not just, uh, for want of a better term, a, a green initiative. Actually, they are thinking about it's a green initiative to bring benefits to communities. So that's that's good to hear. Um, again, a lot of the IWA Restoration Hub's work of late has been proving that kind of community uh, issue contribution. Um, a very quick question from from Bob Dewey: Is this England and Wales? Uh, I believe it is England and Wales, but it may look slightly different in Wales as as um, we, we while we share a lot of common themes, things get altered slightly um, between between the borders. And I don't believe this is currently looking at Scotland at the moment, but again, it, it could be very 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 easily um, transposed if if it's liked. Okay, I think I think we've reached the uh, end of the questions there, uh, for which I'm very very grateful for everything you've put forward. Um, just to wrap up, uh, obviously, thanks to Alex for all the work that he has been doing. As I say, there is guidance notes. Uh, we are uh, writing guidance notes about this. It is a very new, uh, very new um, uh, kind of way of looking at things. And as ever swinging, interestingly, swinging a lot of power into the kind of um, planning uh, arena. Um, and the IWA is working on how, how best to actually help uh, support restorations with this. Um, as ever, I would say, please do keep up a dialogue with the Restoration Hub because uh, it's through all your efforts that we are, we are learning about the various uh, issues and all the good stuff, all the, the lessons learnt um, uh, is how we, how we manage to keep everybody uh, up to speed. Um, so if that's that, uh, I think I'd like to wrap up there. Uh, thanks to Alex and thanks to you all for joining. I hope you've all found it useful.